This video is sponsored by Zach's Investment and Research. All right, so we are here at San Antonio for the Ford first drive event for the F-150. And I just got my keys. I'm excited to go. We have a 110 mile circuit. So, look at that. That's pretty cool. So here we go. When it comes to a car company's plans for the future of electric vehicles, their strategy can be really telling. In the case of Ford, they decided to go with their icons, starting with the Mustang Mach-E. Now, I know it's not a two-door sports car, it's a crossover with four doors, and that's a whole other topic. But it is a really good-looking, cool car. And second up for Ford is this, the Ford F-150 Lightning. And if you don't look close enough, you might think this is just another old Ford F-150. And even that, is deliberate and on purpose because what they did when they set out to make this truck is they came out to Texas and they talked to truck owners and they wanted to make sure that whatever they built would be something that truck owners would immediately identify with and appreciate. And that level of detail pretty much extends to everything about this truck. But there are some clues to tell you this is an electric vehicle. For one, look at the front grille. There's no longer a big engine that needs to be cooled. That's where actually the battery cooling happens. But there's also some other small aerodynamic changes. Most telling probably are these, they're rims, which are very aerodynamic because they wanna eke out every extra mile of range. Everything about this truck is really deliberate. Take for example, how you get into the truck. Now this might look familiar to you. I remember this from Fords back in like the 90s, but this keypad is still there. And their idea is that if you have work gloves on, you can still punch in the code to get into your truck. Or if you wanna get into the truck, because the handles don't hide or anything else like that, all you do if you have the keys with you, you put your hand in the hole, car unlocks, and you're into their truck. All built for people who use these things for work. And that gets to the second point about this truck. Ford had the very unenviable task of building a truck for everyone. Do you use a truck for work? Do you use it for play? Do you go camping with it? Is it a lifestyle choice? Is it a fleet buy? Well, this kind of has to fill all those niches and that's what makes it so interesting. Equally telling about what Ford did here is how the numbers and the figures have changed since when they first unveiled it. So from a year ago when I first saw this truck at their proving grounds in Michigan, there's some changes. And how did it go? Well, everything is better. The range also is better than they first said. All of this has resulted now with an EPA figure of 320 miles of range for the extended version. And if you're a truck guy, you'll appreciate the fact that this is an F-150. It has a power up and down tailgate, for example. It has the cool Ford tape measure out here so you can measure stuff if you're cutting lumber. And one thing that this truck adds that no other F-150 can do as well is there's power outlets all over the place. There are 110 and 240 volt power adapters here in the trunk. So you power all your machinery and power tools here. There's even a 240, which can charge another EV even if you wanted to. And of course, if you're familiar with Ford products, you know there's a step that extends out and even a handhold that you can pull out for even better access into the bed. And it's that sort of stuff that if you're a Ford owner and a Ford fan, this is the truck you want. It's the best trim of the F-150. So I drove the Rivian R1T recently, and one of the coolest things about that truck is the gear tunnel, this massive area where you could store tons of stuff. The Lightning doesn't have anything like that, but the front trunk is fantastic. Easy to get in because of this easy load. All right. Here goes nothing. <laughs> wow, there's actually a lot of room in here. It's not bad at all. I'm not gonna lie, that feels like getting buried alive when it comes down, but it's actually pretty spacious. I had even more room. I was probably two, three inches from the top and I had tons of room that way. Yeah, there's even more storage underneath. And if you have a e-scooter or a one wheel, things like that, you could throw it in the front, plug it in and charge it while you're driving between locations. That's pretty cool. That would come in handy too for all of our filming and things. You could throw all your gear, have everything charging, kind of be isolated, go in for a lunch or something and, and, and know that their stuff is secure. The charge door is on the driver's side up here in the front. There's a matching visual piece that looks like that, but that's actually just a dummy door. This is where all the charging happens. 
It has a CCS plug, of course, J1772 on top. And what's interesting is if you get the home adapter to power your house, the smart adapter, what it does is it charges over AC on the top pins. And when you power your house back from the car, it uses the DC pins underneath. Pretty cool. So Ford's ADAS, Advanced Driver Assist System, is called Blue Cruise. And to enable it, there's two things. You have to first of all have lane keeping assist on. So now that is on. And then you gotta have the cruise control on. Here you can adjust the following distance as you like. And once you have both those conditions met, you're in hands-free mode. So you, you see how it allowed me to take my hands off. Now there's a camera here that's watching my eyeballs to make sure I'm paying attention. Now I will say, Blue Cruise is geofence. It doesn't just work anywhere like Tesla's does. So instead what they've done is they've gone through and routed about 130,000 miles of roads in North America, and that's growing all the time where Blue Cruise is available. If you drive on a road that doesn't have that, you can't turn this on. If you're wondering just how important this truck is to Ford, here are some stats. They reached 200,000 reservations in just a few months. From their original plans, they have expanded the size of their new factory twice. They have updated their production volume to 150,000 trucks per year because of the demand. They're working with Redwood Materials, J.B. Straubel's recycling company, to recycle scrap batteries and also batteries that reach the end of life. Taking a page out of the Tesla playbook, Ford will be partnering with SKI Innovations to build two battery factories they're calling Blue Oval SK in Kentucky. All the batteries made in these two plants will be for Ford's EVs. I can't stress enough how important this is. In fact, it's these sorts of investments that caused a rise in Ford's stock price over the past year. But the stock market is a mysterious thing, which is why I'm happy our sponsor this week is Zach's Investment and Research. Start with the Zach's Investment and Research free e-letter, and it's like getting a cliff note summary of the market in your email. Each issue gives you five newly added Zach's Strong Buy stocks and timely commentary, which I think we could all use right now. If you're like me, you love the idea of benefiting from dozens of people's hundreds of hours of research in just a few minutes. Zach's performance is also impressive. From 1988 through December 2021, they've more than doubled the S&P 500, the benchmark, with average gains of over 25% per year. They also offer a premium research plan if you really want to take your investing to the next level. So if you're interested in learning more about Zacks, check out the link in the description to get started for free today. Huge thanks to Zacks and you for supporting the companies that support this show. So the first part of our trip is around town until we reach our little mountain passing where that'll be more of a fun, dynamic driving test. But around town, what kind of stuff matters if you're new to EVs? To me, it's a couple of things. Auto hold. Second is one pedal driving. And in this truck, we'll get to the sound that it's making in a minute. But in this truck, so here we are, I'm accelerating. And if I come off the, the accelerator pedal, that is a healthy level of regen. And it is really one pedal. Because if I were to stop, it'll bring me down to zero. Complete full stop and there's zero. And because of the auto hold, it'll just keep me here. As far as the acceleration around town, again, you're gonna be the fastest truck on the road. I've already passed a couple of people, but it looks just like a normal truck. That is until you blow past somebody and they realize what the heck does he have going on? Cause it made no noise and it just left me for dead. So I have gotten a little bit of attention that way, but it's a fun way to get around town. It's, it's quick, but in terms of noise, vibration, harshness, this is a really smooth truck. It's high off the ground. The suspension travel is massive. So for people who drive pickup trucks all day, you know how comfortable they are. And this is no exception. It's not especially dynamic. I'd say the levels of body roll are, are a little bit high. It is better than any other Ford F-150 because of that heavy battery pack on the floor. The center of gravity is lower and it does handle better, but it still does have a fair bit of, of body sway. You can feel that as I'm, you know, feel like I'm captaining a ship. But if you drive a pickup truck, you'll appreciate how vastly improved it is. Maybe I'm comparing it to like an EV sedan or a Rivian at the lowest spring height setting. One of the things I always look for in every EV I drive is the throttle mapping. So again, it's a fly-by-wire accelerator pedal, which means there's no linkages, there's no throttle bodies and, and butterflies to open. It's all digital, it's electric vehicle, right? So how you map that pedal is vitally important. If you watch my video on the Ford Mach-E, one of my gripes was that very low speed, like zero to two, three, four, five miles an hour, it was a bit 
kind of notchy. It felt like it was clicking through some small profiles. And this truck is actually kind of similar here. We'll come to a stop, okay? So here in the very beginning of the pedal, I don't know if you can, there's a, there's a, if you look at the mirrors, you can see them kind of jitter. And that's because in the first, I'm not even, I'm going eight miles an hour now, but early part of the pedal feel, there's just kind of a notchiness to it. After about 10 or 12% on the throttle, it is nice and linear. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's very sporty. I'm in sport mode right now, by the way. There's a normal mode as well. But after that, it feels really nice. It, I put my foot down where I expect it to be and the car responds like I'd expect it to. But that notchiness is just a little bit of maybe some software refinement that they'd have to improve on in the future, and they probably could, but really it's not a big deal. I look for it because I'm always mapping that part out, but the average person, you might never even notice it. And again, compared to a gas car with its 10-speed gearbox that's constantly shifting and stuff, this is smoother than any other gas truck you can buy. Ford had a very difficult job to be both modern and high-tech with all the gadgetry that you'd expect in an EV while also appealing to their core truck buyer. So to that end, there's a couple of things that they left in that I'm, I kind of understand and I see the point for it, but the first is this gear shifter. This massive gear shifter is completely unneeded. It's an electric vehicle. You don't have to move big cogs around and shift different gears in your transmission. It's all digital and you're just, changing the polarity of the power to the motors. And if they had done away with that, then all this area would be freed up for other things. But as it is, they do have the cool trick that even the gas trucks have, which is a button right here, which you, you click. When in park, the entire shifter folds down into, the, into this area. And why would you want that? Well, because of this. This is a workbench. So if you have a laptop or some papers, you're taking notes, whatever, this comes in handy to be able to do stuff as you drive. But the thing is, this should always be possible. There's really no reason for any of that. They could just have a little stock or a little shifter right here or on the wheel that shifts into drive and park. Those things are just not that important in the EV world. In a similar vein, there's a start button, which I've always kind of called out as kind of a weird thing to leave in a car that doesn't need a start button. A gas car cannot turn itself on. So you have to have an electric motor, crank it and turn it until the gas can self-sustain. But you don't need any of that in an EV. In an EV, you just provide some juice and it's ready to go. And I kind of understand these decisions, right? If you're a truck guy, you've had an F-150 your whole life, and you hop into this, does it feel familiar? Does it feel the same? Because odds are, if you like trucks, you're not trying to be radically different, right? That's kind of the difference in the buyer. If you're an early Tesla adopter, you love tech, you update your phone all the time, you're buying new stuff, you love the new and the cool and the exciting but a lot of buyers aren't like that. They like the familiar. And so that's what this truck is, is a bridge. It's a bridge to bring both of those people together. Speaking of bridging the gap, you'll notice if you listen, <laughs> going 60 miles an hour, this is a really quick truck, but that sound you heard is actually just in software. And that is a setting here for propulsion sound. So let's hear that one more time. The microphone should pick it up. Here we go. Okay, that is, it sounds like a really throaty V8 truck. It's pretty cool. But if I turn that off, and now here we go. Now it has that high tech sound as opposed to the throaty V8. They went to great lengths to appeal to their current buyer. But even then, three out of four of their reservation holders are new to Ford, meaning they didn't have Ford cars or trucks before. This is going to sell well long into their model lineup. Also, these Fords have big screens now. This is bigger on the Lightning. And if you've driven a Mach-E, it'll feel very intuitive to you. The volume is the only real physical control for things like climate control. You can control the fan speed here. So it's all touch on screen and temperature is also similarly here on screen. But because you can drag around with your finger, it makes it a little bit easier to set like 72 degrees. There we go. And it's, it's all set up. So the, uh, the navigation and the general touch response is good. Not great, not as good as the best cars I've seen, but it's definitely better than other cars I've driven recently. Like the ID4, for example, this is a little bit 
a little bit zippier than that. But compared to like the Teslas, for example, I think there's just a little bit more of a delay. But one thing this car has that the Teslas don't have is Apple CarPlay, which is really nice because it gives you the ability to look at your messages, play your music, all without having to touch your phone, which is also really cool because you have a spot to wirelessly charge your phone. So you get in the car, drop your phone in the compartment, and take everything else here on screen. There are other benefits to this being an F-150, things like the Pro Trailer Assist mode and helping features that help you latch onto a trailer, help you tow and all that sort of stuff, which we'll mess with more tomorrow. Ford wants you to know this is an electric truck because they have outlets and things everywhere. I mentioned in the front trunk, there are four plugs and a 240 in the trunk in the tailgate. And there's a 12 volt cigarette lighter here in the front and also a 110. Plug in your laptop, you can charge it on the go. It's the same in the back seat as well. This is one of those epic road trip cars. Everybody in the family can be charging their toys, their iPads and Nintendos and all that sort of stuff. And there's enough power for everyone. And what's really clever is they even have a mode to say, leave me this much range. And you can plug in whatever you want and it'll power whatever you want and it'll stop when it gets to a critical range. And it even has a clever feature where it knows where the chargers are and it'll stop powering outlets and stuff when it reaches a point where you could no longer be able to reach the next charger within that radius of, of, of distance. So they've thought about all this stuff. In terms of their charging network, they call it the Ford Pass and it's a conglomeration of different networks. The premier network on their system is Electrify America, which is pretty good. They're getting better all the time. And so with Ford, if you go to any EA station, it's just plug and charge. There's no payment gateways or anything else. The other networks, you still have to deal with that part of it. But the good news is you don't have to have an account for ChargePoint and for Blink and everybody else. All you would do is anybody in their network, you use your Ford credentials to log in and start charging. And in the future, don't be surprised if that gets better and better especially because it seems like Ford is taking this seriously and they are actually actively driving around, checking out different chargers and checking out how the networks are doing. Because as, a, as an EV owner, the last thing you want to do is pull into a station and realize it's out of commission. And that's happened to me before on a road trip with the ID4, as I've mentioned. It was at an EA station that was not operable. But these cars and those networks have to talk well together. And this is still early days, so... I would imagine it's not going to be as bulletproof as Tesla's supercharged network. That's just the reality of it. But I think if companies like Ford are actively investing into the networks, that will really help. So as I mentioned, I've recently driven the Rivian R1T, which I think is probably a pretty good benchmark for all electric trucks. So first and foremost, this does not have an air suspension, which means it can't raise and lower, and it doesn't have like active suspension handling characteristics, which you can tell because the car does have a little more body roll and it does sway it. Again, I'm, I'm comparing it to, I think, cars and sedans. If you're a truck guy, this is like the most planted truck in the world because that battery pack is heavy and on the ground. It has a low center of gravity and handles well. But compared to the Rivian, the Rivian has various modes. You can even have it lower down. And in the lowest mode in the Rivian, it almost feels like a sedan. It's, it's an amazing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde transformation that that truck can do, which just is not possible if you don't have a adaptive suspension but that being said there is a multi-link suspension in the back which is kind of a first for fords and it does handle really well on road which gets to probably the the crux of this video which is who is this truck for that's the question i've been thinking about since i flew in here uh yesterday because if you think about it there's a couple of different car buyers there's a Toyota tacoma the tacoma is probably the perfect analogy for the rivian r1t if you drive a Toyota tacoma You'll love the Rivian R1T. It is more money, of course, I understand that. But the Rivian, like out Tacoma is a Tacoma in every way. It is incredibly powerful, fast, and really capable. It has room and storage and all that sort of stuff. So compared to the Tacoma, I don't know if this would be a comparable because this is a big truck. And so for that reason, I'm not sure if this would be the exact truck for you if you were a Tacoma person. Then there is like the F-150 buyer, right? The full size, the midsize truck buyer, which is the most popular category. And so if you're in that category, I think you should absolutely get this truck because there's a Mustang up there and he's not going to have a chance to keep up with me. <laughs> he's making a lot of noise, but he's not going anywhere. <laughs> That's a GT 5.0 Mustang. 
but he doesn't stand a chance. What I love about what Ford did is they upped the horsepower numbers, they upped the range numbers. They didn't like over promise and under deliver, they did the opposite. They made this truck the clear winner in that lineup. Even the Ford Raptor kind of pales in comparison to this truck. At freeway speed, I got it, I got it. Hey, he's a Ford guy. He should appreciate that. So it's a Ford truck making your car look slow. The last three or four hours I've been driving, I'm averaging 2.2 miles per kilowatt hour. So if you live in Texas, let's do some quick math. If you live in Texas, it would cost you about 50 bucks to fill up a natural gas F-150 to go about 300 miles, factoring about 18 miles a gallon, which according to fuelly.com is the average for all the trucks last year for F-150s, 50 bucks. To go an equivalent range, 300 miles, in this electric Ford F-150 would cost $13. That's the savings. In California, it gets ludicrous, right? The gas truck would cost you $100 to go 300 miles, and the EV, if you charge at home, is around $13, and if you charge it out and about, maybe $35. But that savings is dramatic. Again, this is the best F-150 you can buy. You have a mobile generator. You can power 240 volt appliances like heavy duty table saws. You're going air, pneumatic air compressors. Everything you need at a job site. You don't have to run a generator or anything else. The truck is the generator. One of the things I love about what Ford has done that Tesla still does not do is the ability to run vehicle to load, which means you can plug in your car to your house and power your house if the power goes out. And what's really cool is Ford even allows you to power your house if there is power to save on your electric bills. You can have your car charge from midnight to 6 a.m. if you have cheaper prices around that time, and then you can run your house from 4 to 9 p.m. when prices are higher. All of that with this truck. And this truck can output nine kilowatts, which is absolutely staggering. And if the power goes out, I would recommend you turn off stuff like air conditioners, keep it to critical loads, and if you do that, you can go 10 days without recharging. For me, the one thing holding me back from loving, loving, loving this truck is the air suspension, which I didn't even know I would love so much. But after that R1T, I do like the idea of lowering it down and having a little more of a handling characteristic when I need it and raising it back up when I need, when I need that. But I do hope that in like mid-year cycle refreshes, Ford does include the option for an air suspension because I just think that's a winning combination. Ford says that the F-150 Lightning is going to do 0-60 to 60 in about 5 seconds for the standard battery and mid-4s for the extended range pack. But what does that really mean or what does that feel like? Well, here we go. I'm going to roll out and here we go. <laughs> oh my god. Holy crap. What's crazy about this is if you've driven fast trucks before, you're going to know that they rock all that weight in the front engine, all the center of gravity being really high, the car is gonna rock. And if you don't have any weight on the back, it's gonna pitch quite a bit. But this truck stays really well planted. That's, <laughs> this is the perfect road for this. And we're in a truck, this is not a sports car, and I'm not saying that it is. It's quite, you know, it has that big floaty feel to it, but it's comfortable and it's quick. And because of that low center of gravity, it does still, it's pretty rewarding to drive, especially on roads like this. One other thing about towing and hauling that you should probably remember if you're buying a truck is when you go up and down hills, that could be pretty hairy, especially if you have a big load, a big trailer. This does tow you know, upwards of 10,000 pounds, right? So when you're doing that and you're coming downhill, all that extra momentum now has to be dissipated. And on a normal gasoline truck, it has to be dissipated by your transmission. Typically these trucks have transmission coolers and also by the brakes. Both of those are wildly inefficient compared to what this truck can do, which is regeneratively brake. So when you're going downhill, you can recoup some of that cost. And as a result, when you get back down to the bottom of the hill, you'll have more range than when you started, which is pretty amazing. And you don't use the brakes and stuff quite as much. It's been an absolutely amazing day with this truck. We're entering the home stretch at this point. We've done, I think, 60 miles or so, and 
the efficiency that I've been tracking this whole time has just jumped to 2.3 miles per kilowatt hour. All right, so we just finished a 110 mile circuit all the way around. So the first 25 miles or so, I was driving like a banshee, just flooring it, and I was getting about 1.8 miles per kilowatt hour. The final 71 miles, I drove like a normal person, <laughs> and we averaged 2.3, which is a little less than the rated range number would have indicated. So we came back with 178 miles of range. That's almost identical to what you'd expect. Like I mentioned, 2.44 miles per kilowatt hour is the measuring stick. It means you're getting one to one, anything less than that, and you're not gonna get the full range that you think you will. But considering that we were having fun, first time driving, there's a lot of conditions and hills and everything else, Pretty impressive. All right, I did not think we would have this opportunity, at least on this trip, but we're about to do Ford's special off-roading course, and from what they tell us, it's pretty challenging, and I'm not, I'm not Mr. Off-Road by any means. Holy crap, look at that. We're going down that way. Yeah, this is gonna do, this is gonna do. So we're in off-road for the drive mode. Look at that. Yeah, you see a little kind of go back and forth all right that was like a breeze it just looked hard but it wasn't you're gonna love electric trucks they're absolutely remarkable when it comes <laughs> we're all shaking all over the place they're absolutely remarkable when it comes to how much control you can get with all that power so this power this truck has 580 horsepower but it's not just that it's the fact that there's no transmissions there's no turbos to spool up you don't have to go into low gear and high gear it's none of that you just handle the foot, your accelerator pedal input, and everything else is kind of taken care of for you. All right, here we go on the hard route. One of the tricky bits when you're off-roading is when your two wheels go into divots and the center part where all your drive train bits are can contact, but this truck has a really hardcore skid plate. Wow, <laughs> that is wild. Look at that view, dude. All right, so um, we're gonna do a little rally course. You can see this guy flipping around, look at that. All right. Holy <laughs> All right, and then I'm gonna go full traction off. Woo, there's <laughs> the tail coming out. All right. <laughs> All right, I think I'm gonna slow it down a little and turn traction control off entirely now. All right, so I gotta press and hold and hold for advanced track off. Advanced track is off. So now it should just be whatever I do, it'll, it'll take, ooh. Oh. All right, let's try to keep it on, on road here as much as we can. All right, holding a nice little line. All right, here we go. I'll just come in nice. Got nice and sideways there. A little slalom. Tight turn.
All right, so <laughs> I just had the most fun I've ever had in a pickup truck, for sure. The off-roading was awesome, but this is probably more of my speed. Um, it doesn't feel like a 7,000-pound truck, and I got sideways quite a bit, had the traction control turned off, and uh, did a little slalom on this rally course, and that was, that was good fun. You're going to love this truck. All right, let's go. So is the Ford F-150 right for you? Honestly, that's up to you, right? Trucks are about your image and your identity. And if you're a Cybertruck person, get the Cybertruck. If you prefer the Rivian, go with that route. And if you're an F-150 fan and you're thinking about the Lightning, I think you're gonna absolutely love it. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. There are a couple things that would probably change, but to my eye from the front, I like how it looks. I think it drives really well. And it's got a ton of really cool features that you can't get from any other car. Uh, that isn't an EV, like charging a car at home, powering your home in the case of an emergency, never needing to do oil changes or anything else, and going off-roading and all the other good stuff. So if you're curious about this truck at all, you owe it to yourself. Get down to a Ford dealership and request a test drive and go make your own decisions about it. All right, that does it for me. I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you guys on the next one.